We have Jen McDonald from Columbia University. Uh, 30 minutes up, 10 minute comments, 20 questions. Where you go? Cool. You have five minutes. Oh, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, and I'll give you five minutes. I was like, do I need to leave that? Yeah, if, if, if you're worried about time, I'll give you a five minute warning, too. Oh, please do. I'll try to keep an eye on it, but I'm, t I'm pretty bad. Okay. Um, okay, great. Hi. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, so, I am talking today about um, causal models and specifically, like, what they're up to in philosophy. So, the very particular task is to isolate the contribution of causal models to a specifically counterfactual analysis of causation, where those counterfactuals are interpreted, or evaluated rather, via a similarity semantics. All right, so I'm already bracketing um, like causal models in, um, in the sciences as they're used to discover causation. I'm bracketing Woodward's interventionism, which interprets models counterfactually, but evaluates those using interventionist semantics. Um, but, Right, but I take this project to be of interest. That question will come up, um, which I'll say more about later. Okay, so um, so in, in isolating this contribution, I've like come up with a few questions of like maybe this is what the causal models are doing. So first, are causal models needed to tell us what causation is? Um, I'm going to argue that no, they're not needed in that respect. Um, do they shed much needed light on the importation question, which is like the kind of key challenge for counterfactual semantics? I'm going to argue no, they don't. Um, can they answer otherwise un unanswerable questions about what causes what? Um, you know, and I'll argue no. So, okay, great, so what do they contribute? Um, the kind of upshot is that models serve as a purely optional heuristic device. They do draw our attention to de facto counterfactuals, um, the need for them or the promise of them. Uh, in an analysis of causation, um, they can organize at least certain sets of counterfactuals that are like, related in the right way, in a, a cohesive way, um, and they do bring into relief the unanswered importation question at the heart of really any counterfactual semantics and thereby any counterfactual analysis of causation. So I'll do a very quick review of like what is a counterfactual analysis of causation, what's a causal model analysis of causation, um, the details are all on the handout in like kind of a formally, at least roughly formally rigorous way. Um, but I'm just going to do like a quick, like you're my undergrads uh, lecture on the board. So um, I'll assume we're all familiar with counterfactuals. Counterfactual analysis is just uh, that causal dependence is sufficient for causation. So causal dependence is just pairwise counterfactual dependence where the occurrence of something, had that occurred, then this would have occurred. Had it failed to occur, then the other would have failed to occur. Um, now, the like, naive counterfactual analysis takes this also to be necessary for causation. Like This is just the full analysis. But of course, redundant causation makes trouble for it, such as preemption, overdetermination, and stuff. So there are complications to this view, which I'm going to discuss. But this is all I need to do to get, all, this is all I need to get on the table at the moment. I'm assuming some of an ordering semantics for the counterfactuals, so they're true or false based on what's going on in the nearest possible worlds. Also further assume that the nearest possible worlds are determined by um, some kind of similarity function. This isn't strictly necessary for the argument. Um, in fact, ordering semantics isn't strictly necessary for the argument. Um, I suspect the argument generalizes to like a premise semantics or a filtering semantics. Um, I also think the argument does transfer to like interventionist semantics, but I'm just narrowing my focus because I've got like five minutes left after I tell you about causal models. <laughs> so let's do that next. Um, so a causal model formally is a set of variables. Each variable has a range of values, um, and then a set of uh, asymmetric functional equations defined over those variables. Um, so we uh, so we might have like x can take the value. 1 and 0, y can take the value 1 or 0, and then set these up in some kind of um, way so that um, the value of y is determined in an asymmetrical way by the value of x according to some specified function. Um, and it's asymmetrical because the idea is that um, what this tells you is that uh, if you were to intervene on x, where an intervention it's a surgical operation on the model. 
that um, basically, uh, maybe a more complicated model really to show this. Let's give, let, give me a z that also takes one and zero. And we'll say that z is determined by some function over y. So we've got a chain. Um, an intervention just on y, say, is going to replace the equation for y with just a constant function y equals, and then you intervene on y to set it to one of its values. So say we're intervening on it to set it to one, y equals one. And the thought is if you do this, um, and then plug this value in here, that's going to have the functional effect on z, and the same thing if you do y equals zero via an intervention. Um, and you plug zero in here, that's going to have the effect on z. So, um, so it's a causal model, you can represent it graphically. Here, the graphical representation would be this. As I said, it's a chain. So the value of x determines the value of y, which determines the value of z. It's just qualitative data so far. I haven't told you how it depends on the value, but we might say uh, a natural dependence would be like y just takes the value of x. Right? So if x is 1, then y is 1. If x is 0, y is 0. Um, that's kind of all you need. Uh, to get the argument off the ground, so that's where I'll stop with what a structural equation model is. Um, but the question then arises, like, how might you utilize this to give an analysis of causation? So I take any analysis that uses causal models um, of causation to be comprised of three parts. Um, the first is like a model relative recipe, so it takes a particular model and it tells you what it would be or what it is for the value of some variable in the model to be an actual cause of the value of some other variable in the model. And so this story is purely in terms of a specific model. It says x equals 1, causes y equals 1, just in case. Um, had x been 1, then y would have been 1, where the had x been 1 is interpreted via these interventionist, um, like if you intervene to set the um, well, the x to 1, then y would be 1 and had to intervene. To set x to 0, then y would be 0. Um, uh, and that's like the simple causal model recipe that's out there. It's just like, it's almost like just the parallel of the counterfactual analysis. Like, um, one value of x is, is uh, so this would be c, this would be e, this would be not c, this would be not e, right? And it's like kind of just the same thing. Um, but notice that it's specific to a model. It's in terms of a model. If I have a different model, even if I have an x in that model, it's not necessarily the same x as this model. So, um, so how do you get uh, verdicts of causation simpliciter? Um, the standard move, what I should be the standard move, is to quantify all over all like appropriate models. Um, but this doesn't really make sense until you interpret your model, right? For me because these are just symbols. They don't actually have content yet. So um, I'm going to say that an assignment of content to a model, uh, sorry, an interpretation of a model is an assignment of content to the values of the variables, kind of just in this sense, right? So like one is this event, um, whatever it is, leaving the door open. Um, zero would be uh, closing, leaving the door shut. Um, the rules for interpretation are as should be like pretty intuitive that the range of things assigned to a single model should be mutually exclusive so that the variable can only take one value at a time. Um, the range of values should also be exhaustive, which should cover like all possible alternatives so that your variables take at least one value. Um, and then the values of different variables need to be distinct. So this idea is familiar from like traditional counterfactual accounts where your events C and E need to be distinct. Um, if you have like the left hand side of the table is made of wood and the whole table is made of wood, you're going to get a counterfactual dependence between those two things, but that counterfactual dependence is not causation because there is they stand in this other relation that's underwriting that counterfactual dependence, namely like meritological or constitutional dependence. So, um, so C needs to be distinct from E, C needs to be distinct from not E, not C needs to be distinct from E, and not C needs to be distinct from not E. 
And that's just that's an interpretation. And then plugging those into, uh, those into the equations, you get a set of counterfactuals represented by a model. Um, so, um, so in analyzing causation, you quantify the model relative recipe, which is purely in terms of the model, and then you quantify over a range of appropriate model interpretation pairs, where the interpretation needs to be apt, like it needs to satisfy those three conditions I just laid out, of exclusivity, exhaustivity, and distinctness. This is all in the handout, but... Um, and then the counterfactuals that are represented by the model need to be true. Uh, so if it says false things, then it's not going to be telling us what causes what, right? Okay, so that's just an accuracy condition on the model. And so then the thought is, if there's at least one apt model, so of all the apt models, if there's at least one that witnesses um, C causing E, that is, um, whatever represents C in that model satisfies that model relative recipe um, relative to whatever represents E in that model, then that's what it is for C to cause E. Um, the quantification here, note, was existential. This is kind of a conventional choice. Like, you can pick whatever quantifier you want. You can have a graded quantifier. Like, you can say most appropriate models are apt models. You could say all apt models. Um, and what's going to vary with the quantifier is just what work your notion of aptness needs to be doing. So the domain of apt models needs to, like, not let in any models that witness false verdicts if you've got a universal quantifier. With an existential quantifier, the concern is letting is making sure that you let in a model that witnesses that positive, a positive verdict for an actual causal relation. But I'm going to assume an existential quantifier because that's kind of standard way to go in the philosophy literature. Um, the account of aptness I gave you already is like kind of widely agreed upon. Um, it's inadequate along a couple of dimensions, one of which will come up later. Another of which I'm not talking about today, but I think Sondra might raise in his response. But what I've laid out is like universally adopted and like I think has some pretty forceful intuitive justification behind it. So I'm just sticking with that. Okay. Yeah, 13 minutes. Man, okay. Anyhow, so um, so then uh, uh, so you have like the full story of what an actual cause is in terms of the model on page two. C is an actual cause of E if and only if there's a model M on an interpretation I M such that that interpretation represents C as X equals X, E is Y equals Y. X equals X is an actual cause of Y equals Y in that model according to the whatever model relative recipe you have. And then um, the model's apt. The model and the interpretation are apt for representing these things. Um, so the first question on the table, I should say that the, I'm like skipping over a bunch of like details as to how the different features of a model um, and a causal model analysis of causation map onto like a more traditional uh, similarity counterfactual account of causation. Um, and I'm just going to focus on what I take to be the most interesting um, like contribution of the causal model account of causation. Um, and so this is. Uh, introduction of what Hitchcock, Chris Hitchcock calls explicitly non-foretracking counterfactuals. So to get this on the table, I'm first going to say, so now we've got these simple accounts, neither of which handle redundant causation. So like Susie and Billy both throw at the same time, the rocks hit the window at the same time, the window breaks, you don't have counterfactual, simple counterfactual dependence between the window breaking and either Susie's throw or Billy's throw, or this is symmetrical over determination. Um, the causal model account can't handle this as it's written. The simple counterfactual account can't handle this. So both of them introduce complications. Um, we're all likely familiar with the complication introduced by the traditional counterfactual account, which is chains of causal dependence, right? So, um, so now uh, it's sufficient for causation that you have causal dependence, but what's necessary is just that you have some chain of causal dependence. So. Um, It might be that F does not, sorry, this pair F and not F don't causally depend on C and not C um, directly, but there is some like intermediate event such that F um, kind of actually depends on E and not F kind of actually depends on not E, 
and then those are in turn kind of actually dependent on C. Um, I'm not going to, in the interest of time, walk through why this solves preemption. It notoriously doesn't solve late preemption, and so there's even further complications, but um, it doesn't really matter in, in addressing the kind of specific questions I've raised today. So I'll just talk now a bit about what the causal model analysis does to handle redundant causation. Um, and they actually can handle late preemption cases, which is precisely why you might think this makes real progress uh, for, uh, as a like, cutting edge kind of actual analysis of causation. Um, and they do so by introducing what I mentioned, explicitly non foretracking counterfactuals. Um, but before they introduce those, they actually have already introduced like de facto counterfactuals. So um, this term I think was introduced by Stephen Yonblo. The idea is just that uh, a de facto counterfactual is you have to also hold fixed some stuff. I don't know why, so many arrows, whatever. And D. So C and some set of events D um, uh, were to hold that E would hold, and then if C had failed, but that same set of events D held, then E would have failed. This is a de facto kind of factual because you built into your antecedent um, specific events that need to be held fixed. Um, so notice that. It's not, it's not exactly apparent from such a simple causal model, but parenthood relations, so parenthood relations are any variable that appears on the right-hand side of the equation is a parent of the variable that appears on the left-hand side. So y is a parent of z because some value of y, z is some, so at least one value of z is a function of at least some value of y, right? In this case, it's all the values. Um, so parenthood relations are actually not simple counterfactual dependence or causal dependence relations. The way to, the equations are minimal, so um, you only appear over here if it's the case that intervening to set this variable to some one of its values um, results in the child variable taking some one of its other values when every other val variable in the model is held fixed at its like current value. Um, and so that includes like, so to see whether x goes in here, you hold y fixed at whatever value it has. You check if x has a value, then z has value, and if x has, um, for some other value of x, z has any other value, then x belongs as a parent of y, sorry, of z. Um, and since y, in effect, screens off any dependence that z might have had on x, it's not apparent, right? And so what you're doing is you're holding fixed everything else in the model, and then you're checking causal dependence with that set of things held fixed, which is just precisely de facto causal dependence. Um, so in order to just write the equations, you're already moving beyond the like simple traditional counterfactual account of causation, um, in the Louisian sense, you're shifting into Yablo territory, um, where he talks about de facto counterfactuals. Um, and the explicitly non foretracking counterfactual, which I'm finally can tell you about after flying it twice, um, goes even further. And it's specifically the kind of counterfactual where the, I'll just introduce some other stuff where what's held fixed is downstream of the antecedent variable. So the idea is that you identify a path in your, mod, in your um, graph or a root in your model such that holding everything off that path fixed. And when I say that, what I mean is even if it's downstream of the thing that you're going to toggle, Right? So like normally, counterfactual dependence, you change something, anything that depended on that is going to change. But here, what you're allowed to do is you're allowed to hold some things that depended on the thing that you're changing, you can hold those fixed. So the reason this solves late preemption is that if this is 
Susie throwing, and this is Billy throwing, and this is Susie's rock hitting the window, you can hold fixed that Billy didn't throw in an early preemption case. And then there's just counterfactual dependence between the window shattering and Susie shattering because we're just holding fixed that Billy didn't throw. If this is Billy's rock hitting the window, which it fails to do in a late preemption case, you can just hold fixed that it doesn't hit the window. And then you get it, this reveals the causal dependence between the window shattering and Susie throwing. So this um, introduction of de facto counterfactuals, and specifically de facto counterfactuals where part of D is something itself downstream of C, is precisely how we get the, um, these like satisfying responses to the really tricky redundant causation cases. But notice that, if anything, I kind of like gave you all of that in purely counterfactual terms, right? And so um, there's no reason that we need models in order to talk, like give an account of this kind. If this is in fact the like um, kind of source of the progress made by causal models, um, then we can just do it in terms of counterfactuals without needing to introduce the formalism of causal models. Um, you might think, well, hold on. Do causal models have something to say about this D? Like maybe the Agnes conditions fix the other variables in the model in some way that tells you something like principled about what gets to go in here and at what values. So, for example, overdetermination is not simply fixed by this move. Um, you actually have to hold off path variables at non-actual values. So if um, so this would be a symmetrical overdetermination graph where Susie throws, Billy throws, and window shatters. Um, even if you hold fix that Billy throws, I mean his rock is sufficient to shatter the window, right? You're still not going to recover causal dependence between the window and Susie. The only way to do so is to hold W fixed at some non-actual value, namely you suppose that he didn't throw. Okay, but why do you get to do that? <laughs> Great question. The causal model literature doesn't have a principled story about what values of D are allowed. There are like a few different options in the literature. There's like kind of reasons for and against each of these. One is the simple like it's just actual values, but then you can't uh, give like an intuitive treatment of overdetermination. Another is that uh, you know it's permissible if it, so long as it doesn't change anything on the path. Um, that you're evaluating, um, but my sort of like broad brushstroke response here is just that anything that you um, that we identify here as like the principled story behind D can just be simply put in terms of the counterfactual dependence account. So the models aren't needed to tell us like what causation is, at least in terms of the like kind of cutting edge version of what causation is according to. Okay. Um, according to the most sophisticated causal model accounts. Um, but maybe causal models shed light on the importation problem. So the importation problem um, is so-called, it's Goodman's co-tenability problem. Um, it was coined by the importation question, or the importation problem was coined by Graham Priest a few years back in a paper that just like covered counterfactual semantics generally. And like the question is, I mean actually quote Priest, so um, the importation question is just a general statement of the key challenge for counterfactual semantics, and his quote is this. Call the information that is carried over from the actual world to the world of evaluation the imported information. The worlds where the consequent of the conditional are evaluated are, then, those where both the antecedent and the imported information hold, but exactly what information of this kind is imported. Right? That's like the big question. What gets held fixed and what is allowed to vary? Um, does a causal model analysis answer this question? So, in, in part, we just have an obvious no from the fact that we still don't have a principled story about D. Maybe we'll get a principled story, um, but like, okay, so, um, but in addition, the, this is where I, I circle back to the idea that the story of what accounts as an apt model is open. Um, perfect, thank you. Um, along a couple of dimensions. And the one that I'll just mention is like, so I have like, I have a whole other paper on it. So I'm not gonna go into great detail here. Um, I might just 
like defer to authority and, and quote Hitchcock, who's one of the um, both seminal authors and like you know contemporary experts on this um, on this project. He writes that the question of aptness is really more a matter of art than science. Um, Blanchard and Schaffer, in a more recent paper, um, have something to the effect that like you're not going to get something rigorous and precise. Like don't expect that out of our story of aptness. And so, because um, the thought is that like oh if we just have like a principal story of apt models, then that fixes the space, the possibility space over which we're quantifying, right? Um, in the same way that like an importation. Um, the importation question answers the question of like what can be held fixed and what can vary. But that aptness question itself remains open. So the causal model analysis doesn't at least yet provide, and it doesn't look like it can provide like a complete answer to this question. Okay, well maybe that's a little too high of a standard. Does it at least make progress on the question? Um, here, like I, I need to do more research on this. I think it likely doesn't. So um, so there's work by Pearl, um, Gal, is it Gal or Gals? We're going to say Gal and Pearl, um, and Halpern, also like Briggs, has work comparing a similarity semantics, the logic of a similarity semantics, and like the logic of a, um, interventionist semantics, and, um, or causal model semantics, and the causal model semantics seems to not introduce anything formally like more restrictive or, or rigorous than is already present in a similarity semantics, assuming recursivity. So that might be playing a little role that the only time you can represent a set of counterfactuals usefully in a model for this purpose is when the model is such that once a variable appears on the right hand side, it doesn't then appear on the left hand side. So there's no feedback loops in the model. So you can, um, so assuming that um, condition, it doesn't seem like uh, by allowing counter, uh, causal model representations, we're saying anything new about our counterfactual semantics. Okay, don't worry, I'm wrapping up. Um, uh, you got three minutes or two. Okay, a model does, however, and I got pushed back at the last time I gave this talk, which was the first time I gave this talk. Um, the, the model does like kind of perspicuously um, display content, right? Like especially the graphs, like are just so easy to grasp, and our minds can like just turn through, like can uh, process the information presented in the graph in a totally different way than if I had like given you the like uh, you know six to twenty five counterfactuals <laughs> represented by. Like, I, I, in my paper, tried to lay out every counterfactual represented by, like, a, a three-variable model with two values per variable, and there's something like 25. Like, I had, I had to, like, reduce, um, I had to cut it down because I had a word count issue. Um, so there's, there's a lot of information packed in there in a very, like, you know, representatively cogent, um, accessible way. So, like, that's great. I'm not denying that, right? Um, but you can only do this when the counterfactuals are related in the right way, right? When they can be like um, chained up into parenthood relations, holding between the ranges of the different factors. Um, despite this heuristic benefit, it doesn't seem to determine a unique similarity metric, even assuming accuracy, because different similarity metrics could render true the same set of counterfactuals. So you, you can't say like, oh, well, if you give me a model, then I know what similarity metric you're using to evaluate your counterfactuals. It's actually not true, so that's not something that's brought on board. It's really just like a, a pretty and useful organization of certain sets of counterfactuals. Um, Okay, to be fair, it does reduce the class of similarity metrics possibly in play, but um, the, not beyond what would be achieved by just like a list of counterfactuals. Okay, so the last question, can models answer what causes what questions that are unanswerable by counterfactuals alone? Like the quick answer, given the dialectic, like no, how could they, right? Counterfactual information is baked into the models. Um, and so in this respect, again, for this current project, um, Hall is correct that far from being indispensable, causal models merely provide a useful means for selectively representing aspects of an antecedently understood counterfactual structure. Um, okay, so the conclusion. There's just there's one of two upshots. The upshot I've been pushing for is that um, causal models constitute less progress than it might seem when used as a, like an additional representative device on top of the similarity semantics. Um, 
a different upshot you might have is like, um, well, what you're the like we're taking is given that causal models constitute real progress. Um, in the in the causation literature, and so given that it doesn't look like it's like all that much progress, at least essential to the models, that essentially utilizes the models when you interpret them counterfactually, evaluate using a similarity metric. That just means you shouldn't interpret them counterfactually using a similarity metric. That means that like what we should be doing is focusing on say the interventionist project, where the causal models are used, but counterfactuals are interpreted via interventionist semantics. Or Pearl's project, which interprets the equations as um, either primitive mechanisms, or if you're going to give it a little more metaphysical meat, something like type-level causal relations. Um, I have a different paper that argues that that also doesn't make any progress, but at the moment you're allowed to take that position if you're unhappy with the talk I've given so far. Um, so that's it. Yeah, that's, that should get this thing all over. Oh, sorry. Sorry. What? Do I have to press the button somewhere? This? Mm -hmm. The green button should work, and sometimes yes. you need the right angle. Do you want to plug your computer in and see if I can get it? This is at least true in the recent room. Oh, that's it. It's connected because it's showing up. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, sorry. You know, my, my response is very short here. And there's a couple of people there. So can you make I'm just going to check. I watch every now and then because I'm absolutely certain if I wouldn't do that, I would be talking for more than <laughs> seven minutes. Um, so, so. I took it as my first task as a commentator kind of to mostly give feedback to Jen, and I did that already elaborately prior to this event. Um, um, I can see this some kind of like reviewer pre submission. Um, and then for you, I'm trying to. I'm going to focus more on some conceptual issues because much of the, the, the things I was bringing up are kind of technical nature, which I definitely don't think it's, it's, it's useful or, or even understandable to bring up in a short talk. So I'm going to ask a few conceptual questions about uh, the project, and some of them have already been slightly addressed by some of these Jen said right now. I've grouped them into three kind of topics, so. Get a bit clearer on what is the discussion really about, what's the fundamental disagreement that we might be looking at. Um, then I'm also going to try to get clearer on what view does Jen presuppose about the relation between causal laws and similarity semantics. Well, I have one view, and that flashes with many of the things that Matt says, so I'm trying to figure out, okay, what exactly is going on here? How do you have to bring the two closer together? Where, what is the source of the misunderstanding? But also, by doing that, um, I'm actually going to answer some of my own questions. Namely that I do see a route for someone to take to say, oh, I have even granted you your starting point. I do have a story to tell that causal models do bring something to the table. And it's not a route that, that, that Jen considers, so I'm just bringing it up as something that Someone could do it also, what I'm wondering whether you think that's interesting about. And those those first two things are all just about causal models. But the last part is something about actual causation, unless I've been talking about you. Oh yeah, I should say something about actual causation to start with, just as a, as a, as a personal note. Um, although I agree that the most popular uh, accounts for the past few years can be characterized using these at least in terms of weird counterfactual that you're requiring to hold and some kind of interventions. My own account, my most recent account, it does not satisfy that characterization. I think there's a much cleaner story to tell as to what, why are we holding certain things fixed or not, because it's actually based on the nest idea. To be a necessary element of a sufficient set, which I think is a conceptually clean idea, but I'm cashing it out entirely in interventionist terms. Just as a side note, therefore, that 
It was certainly not an exhaustive description of, of all accounts of actual causation. Okay, what is the discussion about? In particular, usually in philosophy, you take someone whose view you disagree with, and you say, look, this is this person, there's a, they have this view, and I'm going to disagree with that view. In this situation, I'm not so sure as to who that proponent or opponent would be, because the two most influential authors on causal models don't subscribe to the starting point, the starting point being that, uh, oh, causal models, they're actually, so I'm speaking about counterfactuals, but the counterfactuals themselves are underwritten by similarity semantics. So we're still buying into a broadly Louisian picture of counterfactuals. Um, that starting point is not the starting point of Woodward and of Pearl, who are the most two influential authors. They, they have a non-reductive view of causation, and, and they don't want to use it to counterfactuals, let alone counterfactuals of a, a similarity-based view. And then most people actually work on actual causation. Most is a, is a sorry, difficult term to use, but many, they just seem to be really silent about the metaphysics entirely. They just start out with causal models, they capture my stories, we take for granted how we evaluate counterfactuals using causal models. We don't really say anything about do we buy into lose this view or not, so we remain silent. So <coughs> I'm wondering, are there particular people you have in mind? Maybe Hall might be an answer, I'm not sure. Who do start out with the assumption causal models fine, but we're still having this Lewisian view of counterfactuals at the base of it? Um, and then even the answer is, well, no, maybe not particularly, but still. You can still say, sure, that's still a, a position I could take and, and, and investigate what it would amount to. If I were to take a position, causal models, I, I like them, but I want to stick with my similarity-based semantics for counterfactuals, what would then causal models give me? Uh, that's still an exercise you can go through. And in fact, Briggs, in, in, in an influential paper that I'll get to later, does state, in principle, one could adopt, could adopt a reductive, non-logical interpretation of structural equations. Like nothing as such in causal models prevents you from doing that, so you could do that. Um, and just this quote from Jen is simply to, 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 to clarify the assumption that's at the starting point of the paper, right? That, that I've already uh, alluded to. But then, I'm wondering if it isn't that assumption itself already too strong for there to be any interesting dialogue going on uh, to start with. Because if we start with saying causal models, the counterfactual that they express, simply reduce to similarity-based counterfactuals. And if we then ask the question, yeah, but what do the causal models bring to the table? And in particular, bring to the table in a metaphysically substantive sense, right? Because Jen agrees they bring something to the table heuristically, they're, they're useful, but in a metaphysically substantive sense, what do they bring to the table? Well, if you start out with that assumption, then isn't it kind of almost like a tautology to say, well, no, nothing, because we've already assumed that all, that all the meat is in a similarity-based approach. So, but then, that, that would really make for an interesting project if it were that simple. So, so maybe make it clear, I guess, as to why that's not a project. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're about two minutes. Okay. Then causal models and learn semantics. So Pearl already investigates and he puts the relation between his views on compactuals and Luce's view. And he says, look, you can read similarities into interventions, the two operators and afterthought, but they're not based to the analysis. Um, and so I'm going to explain it. The idea is if you have a causal model and the semantics for, 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 for so if you take on board the view of interventions give you what counterfactuals are true or not, then you already have a semantic for counterfactuals, right? You just follow those rules. And you can interpret that semantics as a similarity-based semantics. Pearl proves this. At least he proves it for recursive systems. So it is a similarity semantics, just it, you can't view it in that way. But then sometimes, uh, Jen speaks of it as if we can add a similarity semantics to the causal model. Or in particular, now I realize what, what the crucial point here is, there could be different similarity semantics that could render to the same set of counterfactuals. That's the confusion I guess. But to me, that's surprising. If I take the possible world simply to be all the valuations of the variables, then I don't see how that's the case. Like all the counterfactuals simply determine the similarity metrics. Maybe if there's a broader notion of possible worlds, then that might, might fail, and that's maybe where this the confusion starts or the disagreement. Um, and as Jen alluded to as well, there have been these results. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to compare the semantics for causal model and similarity semantics. And so Pearl and Gauss first had this result. But then Halpern later realized the short look, there were some things that they said were, which weren't very clean, they were very unclear, so cleaned it up. But then also proved that if you move to non-recursive systems, they're not identical anymore. 
Uh, and then three weeks later, you can generalize the language of calls and moles further, because that's one great thing, of course. Counterfactuals expressed using calls and moles are very limited kinds of counterfactuals. There's lots of things you simply can't express. So Briggs generalized it already a little bit to include these junctions, nested counterfactuals, and then showed for that new logic that you have to build up with using causal models, they're even more different. That logic is even more different than Lewis's VC. Um, so it's still a similarity-based approach, but not in any way Lewisian. Um, and so then this could be used to have an argument, maybe, okay, potential argument here. There are many different similarity-based semantics. The disagreements over these are metaphysically substantive. Let's just take that for, for sake of argument there for granted. Then causal model and similarity semantics is very different, that we, we just established that. Um, and then if you also are a fan of causal models, you might say, ah, oh, these semantics are superior to the traditional ones. Therefore, causal models do bring something to the table. They give you the right similarity semantics, and that's what they were used, useful for. Um, and so Briggs doesn't come as, doesn't take that position uh, themselves, but at least in the conclusion, it's there as, as an option. Right. Another possible conclusion is, is that causal models will save all the receipts that are non-factuals, and we should revise the logic of non-factuals. By the way, interesting to note that the other condition that they uh, referred to is that causal models are heuristically useful primarily, so that sounds very similar to things. So I'm, I guess I just have to uh, stop at this point then. Well, I have one minute if I look at my code. <laughs> you can have one. <laughs> um, as to actual causation, it was just a question. So the Aptus criteria, the ones that Jen mentioned, they're all about the causal model itself. Regardless of thinking about actual causation, you could just think of a causal model. Is this a causal model itself appropriate? Uh, and I think the, there's criteria for that, right? It should be correct or accurate, and uh, the, the, the variables should refer to sync events, etc., all those things. But that doesn't really bring actual causation into the picture. I think there are further criteria required to say that a causal model is apt for answering a question about actual causation. And those are the ones to me which are really tricky, and there's been far too little focus on that. Um, and I wonder whether Jen has any, any light to shed on that. I take Susie and Billy, but the late preemption version, right? Susie throws the rockets at first, therefore she's the only cause, and we're going to capture that by a causal model. Well, if I just have a causal model with these three variables, like Susie throws, or Billy throws, and neither of them throwing the ball shatters, that seems to be perfectly appropriate in terms of it's correct, it captures right counterfactuals, but it doesn't give you a right answer for actual causation. So why is that not an apt model for actual causation? What criteria can be used? Yep, I'll, I'll keep it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. As you uh, mentioned, we've been in. I've gotten a lot of feedback as a result of his comments, which I'm super grateful for. Um, so I'll just keep this kind of quick, um, rather than go through point by point. Um, I feel like the first question posed to me is, um, like, who cares? Who am I talking to? Which I think is an important and deep question that I hope most of us struggle with to the extent that I struggle with in falsity. Um, maybe I'm just talking to myself, but, um, but this is just uh, one component of a larger project which looks at the contribution of causal models in philosophy generally. Um, as I mentioned, I have like another paper that looks at whether an interventionist Actually, I didn't mention this one. Interventionist semantics improves uh, similarity semantics, which I think it doesn't, um, at whether um, like causal models generally are making progress um, on the perturbation question, regardless of how you evaluate counterfactuals or how you interpret the models, and I think it doesn't. So this is, a, this is like definitely a circumspect question that I'm posing, uh, or project that I'm engaged with here, but it is part of a greater, greater project where um, I hope that at least the greater project is of some interest to some people somewhere. Um, anyways, I also take this particular piece to be in discussion with Chris Hitchcock, Ned Hall, Luke Fenton Glenn, Lori Hall, Ned, Ned, and Ned Hall co-authored the book. Thomas Blanchard, Jonathan Schaffer, Peter Menzies, Helen Beebe, all of whom have work on causal models utilized in a counterfactual analysis of causation where the counterfactuals are understood reductively. Um, so from the set entry on counterfactual analysis of causation by Peter Menzies and Helen Beebe. They write, a number of contemporary philosophers have explored an alternative counterfactual approach to causation that employs the structural equation framework. Those who have pursued this framework, um, the SEP approach to providing an analysis of actual causation have had very little to say about the semantics of the counterfactuals that underpin 
um, the models. Some authors explicitly and many authors implicitly assume a broadly Louisian approach to counterfactuals, so that the structural equations are representations of relations of facts about counterfactual dependence. There are deep blah blah. Okay, so um, so I think that there is like you know room in the literature for an, an answer to this question of like what they're going to do. Okay. Um, the second question um, is like, kind of, doesn't the framing of my question make it trivial that models are dispensable, that they don't make a substantive contribution? Um, so even if my question were, quote, what do causal models bring that is metaphysically substantive, um, then, then actually not exactly, because it's possible that the framework of causal models are, is required in order to run some kind of algorithm that's required um, for delivering causal verdicts. An algorithm that, for example, would have no natural or obvious or simple translation like out of the model framework. Um, perhaps there's like a black box situation at play. Um, and so there is a little bit, I think, illuminated in, in like de determining the fact that like, no, they're not actually essential. Um, but in fact, the question I do pose is, is just the general question of like, what do they bring? It's like an open-ended question. And I, I maybe am being overly provocative and saying nothing substantive, and you're like, well, we wouldn't have expected something substantive in the first place. Um, so I'm perhaps misleading <laughs> in my dialectic. Um, but I, I have like kind of revised the original paper that Sondra had access to to be just more explicit about the questions that I'm, a I'm asking. So like the three questions that I addressed in the talk. Are causal models needed to tell us what causation is, et cetera. Okay, finally. The how does the similarity semantics work using causal models? Um, so I, I did go over this in my talk, so this might be being a dead horse. Um, but the thought is just that um, you have the models, the models deliver counterfactuals, but those counterfactuals are evaluated in independent terms. Um, so that's the, that's the thought there. But we can talk more about that. Because one thing that's really interesting, the final thing I'll say, one thing that's really interesting about causal models that I wasn't really able to engage in such a with in such a restricted context is there's something peculiar about the fact that um, people can be engaged in the question in the recipe question of like in terms of a model what what's the right um, recipe for what actually causes what but have two at least two there's actually several depending on how you carve it very different metaphysical um, views in place about what underwrites that model. And so there's something actually very interesting about the fact that this single representative device can um, seems to do like the same work in a way, almost regardless of what kind of metaphysics you give it. Um, I'm not sure sort of what to make of that fact. I also think it's like whether that's true is itself, I think, a good research question, or whether it is, in fact, we're talking past each other and we hadn't realized it because this metaphysical assumption is doing this and it like doesn't work in this other framework. So I do think like causal models are interesting, but I, I hoped to address the question for anyone who's like, I'm interested in cutting edge versions of counterfactual accounts. Should I invest in learning the framework of causal models? And I'm hoping to have um, perhaps dissuaded them from doing so, um, unless you really want to. They go for it. That's it. Thanks. All right. 12 minutes for questions. Um, I have a couple of questions, but um, we'll see how we go. Just one. Start with one. I'm yeah, yeah. Might have time for another one. Yeah. The first question uh, just relates to the extension of this into the stochastic case, where you're dealing with probabilistic causal models mm -hmm. rather than all of this like uh, binary stuff, because. One thing the similarity stuff, similarity account of counterfactuals does not do well, and that Lewis does not really spend a lot of time on, is dealing with probability. Mm. Uh, whereas causal models and Bayes nets um, work very well with probability, and there's very like, precise ways to make them work with probabilistic causal reasoning. And so I wonder if, like, I take it, you know, setting aside the question about the starting point, what you're looking for is something that the causal model can do that the similarity counterfactuals can't do, or vice versa. And I think dealing with probability might be one of these one of these things. So I was just curious to hear a bit more. Yeah. This. So um, so I before I get into the probabilistic uh, camp only somewhat, um, I strongly suspect that there's um, so the um, the like issue of aptness and whether there's a complete story about it um, and in this 
context I said like there isn't and there's unlikely to be. I think for, for very similar reasons that transfers to the probabilistic case as well. And so um, you're still not going to get out of causal models like perfectly determinate causal verdicts uh, because of this fuzzy parameter. Um, the other thing I... I think I'll, I think I'll, I'll leave I'll leave my answer there. Um, I, it's it's yeah. I mean, it, it definitely merits its own like discussion because there are details that are somewhat different. Um, what it's worth, I have strong suspicion that like um, what's going on is that it does really well at the type level. Um, I'm not sure that it can accommodate the actual level as well. But yeah, I guess my thought was it's not obvious that you can handle the kind of probabilistic functions that you have in the, the, the like a base net using just similarity-based counterfactuals. I've never seen a good story about how that works. Oh, right. So it's not clear that you can reduce everything down to just like sets of similarity-based counterfactuals. It looks like actually causal models with probability functions over them. Like, that's the thing that's doing the work. And I don't know how to reconstruct that using just sets of counterfactuals, no matter how you load the antecedent. I see, I see. So you're you're kind of taking the second upshot of, like, yeah. causal models do do something. It's this other thing. And, like, that can't be translated into a similarity. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's my yeah. that's my prima facie worry. Like, yeah, so that, it's possible that it does make, um, that it can say more about the probabilistic case. But, like, um, what I meant by these problems transfer is they transfer into the other semantics as well. Like, if the, those problems aren't unique to a similarity semantics, so you're still going to have the aptness problem is still open, mm -hmm. even in a probabilistic framework, where mm -hmm. we're, like, understanding our counterfactuals, mm -hmm. where, like, we're not even talking about counterfactuals, we're talking about type level causal relations, and taking those to be primitive, or we are talking about counterfactuals, but we're interpreting them using, like, an interventionist semantics or something, you still have this very same problem. Mm -hmm. um, so, my, like, I'm interested in that problem, which is, like, yeah. effectively, like, um, which, interestingly, is the importation question for counterfactuals, but it, it's raised even if you have causation at the bottom and counterfactuals supervening on those. So I don't know what problem to call it, but this is actually like my real interest, um, and it's not answered in that framework either. So that's not to say that like maybe that is more progress, and this is like reason to think that we should be going in that direction. Interestingly, there's like a perfectly analogous problem that it still doesn't solve. Um, but I haven't given you any details yet. It's a bit of a promissory note, so yeah. um, I, w I would need to like walk through it myself in order to like explain it. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm just quickly mention I'm writing a paper on exactly that topic, so okay. I'm interested to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, I'd be keen to hear both of the <laughs> these things. Interesting. Yeah. I'll throw in a question. Uh, so right at the end, you mentioned that there's a possibility that the models actually float. Mm -hmm. Far enough off the metaphysics mm -hmm. that uh, is that a promise there that you can start to use those as a kind of generic interoperable way of delivering causal information so you can speak across different causal models like causal accounts so people doing different sciences or people forms of investigation could then filter it up to the model level and then we have a uniform way of recording that information that everybody can access whatever metaphysics they have to do. Yeah, I mean, I think that's precisely what's happening in the okay. sciences. And that's like why everyone's so excited about the models, is that you don't have, you can stay neutral on the metaphysics. And still, like, there's like all kinds of progress being made on our just like actual understanding of reality. So um, I think that feature of the models is precisely why they've taken off. Um, like, Pearl has like a kind of thin metaphysics that he puts on them, but from what I can tell, like, that's not, that's not taken up by everybody. Like, and it is just this formalism that's like you just put correlational inputs in and you get this like ridiculously rich um, causal information out. I and mean, you do, I think, have to put a tiny bit of um, prefigurative causal knowledge into it. But, um, so then it would be bad if they imported actually more knowledge or had more in themselves because they would sort of, they would lose the ability to float quite as well. It's like the more, the more content or robustness that they have in their own metaphysics they're bringing, yeah. the less capable they are of from, serving that sort of broad purpose. From what I can tell, though, Sondra can correct me, they whittle down the space of possible causal models that a set of, uh, that a set of features stand in, given a bunch of correlational data about those features. 
But in order to refine it to a unique causal model, you do have to, to use a little bit of pre-theoretical causal knowledge. Um, but even the whittling down is like uh, amazing. And it might be that they're moving beyond having to use pre-theoretical causal knowledge. Yeah, but there is, of course, there is always going to be some commitment. So Cartwright, for example, is a big critic because if there's a causal mark of a uh, condition, which is always assumed, has to be assumed, and so you can criticize that. But I'd say it's already way more closer to a scientific discussion than, than say, a traditional metaphysical discussion as to what that disagreement is about. So, but, but to be perfectly clear, like, there's, there's no metaphysical grounding for, like, why this works, right? So, like, a philosopher who cares about the foundations is not going to be satisfied, is, like, intrigued by the success, but, like, it's not going to be, there's no story there. Yeah. So, it's, um, like, it's great, it's to be taken seriously, but, like, it's also missing a foundation. Did you say you had another question? Yeah, I've got some other sort of half-baked things. Um, we have time for half-baked. We have four minutes I mean, of half-baked. I mean, the, the, the sort of one of the things I'm wondering about uh, is whether the difference in the quantifier with respect to aptness makes a difference to your argument. I suspect mm -hmm. not, but I wanted to like maybe see what you think because mm -hmm. so like one of the sort of nice things about causal models is you you then have this capacity to like quantify over different sets of models in order to make different claims and like the very same counterfactual might be true in one model but false in another even once you load up the antecedent and so I just wondered like your argument was really based on the existential case but what happens when you look at like generalizing over all the models you, is your thought that you could just recapture everything by quantifying over sets of counterfactuals even though in the causal model case the very same counterfactuals might be like true relative to a model rather than just true simpliciter. So I'm just sort of I'm just wondering if you could help me think through. I see. This so um, so I take the models over which you're quantifying to be a characterization of the, um, the space of possible worlds ordered relative to a particular similarity metric. Or at least that's common to a family of similarity metrics. And if you're existentially quantifying, then you need that space to be narrow because it needs to be talking about the like closest possible worlds. Um, if you're universally quantifying, it can be wider. But like aptness, just um, at the quantifier plus aptness is just like characterizing that. Now you might think that the way it's characterizing that is like more. Is, is bringing something to the table, so I, I, I guess I do want to think more carefully about like specifically how. Uh huh. I and, guess I was in, in sorry. Order to say, no. I guess I was thinking that that might not be how the quantifying of models is always working. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's about granularity. It's about like how much of the information in the system that you're modeling are you including in the model, and like different models will access the system at different levels of granularity. And there's some stuff in Woodward where he. He has an argument that's really interesting in the middle part of the book, but I can never quite get it. But he thinks that there's a sort of like, you fix a, a level of granularity at which you're looking at the models, and that's a sort of like, that special model is giving you special metaphysical information about causation. Um, and so this is about, this is not quantifying over like spaces of worlds, this is quantifying over different ways of representing the same physical system at different levels of uh, detail. Right, so. Um... So, so the same model can't represent the same thing in different levels of detail without violating like distinctness and stuff. Correct. So it's got to, you, you're looking at different models. So it's a set of models, but they they might all like. I mean, it, I guess it's possible that they're all looking at the same set of like worlds, maybe. But but like the the, the models are. Yeah, they're all sort of different yeah. ways of representing the same actual information or a, a, an actual system. This is really helpful because I, I often have this like I have like a hunch that feels sufficiently strong that like oh, I'm not really going to worry. Like, um, but you're right that I need to cash out the details, so I would need to look more carefully at whether what I said is right <laughs> or whether there's something like different going on in quantifying over app models. Um, 
Yeah, and um, I just do have to think more about that. Good. We're out of time. Thanks for our speakers.